Hello guys, welcome to session 3 of the History Discussion Club. So today's focus will be on the balance of power. We'll be talking about the power dynamics and especially the shift in power in Europe during the late 19th century moving into the early 20th century and how the power dynamics had a huge influence over the collective European states uh, such as one's international foreign, foreign policies and how they sought to maintain their security over military alliances and peace treaties. Uh, and we'll be talking about how such events that had unfolded in the late 19th century into the 20th century ultimately led to an inevitable conflict, which was World War I. Um, so we'll be going over five key questions today. The first question is, what is the balance of power and what are the ways in which it can be maintained? Second question is, how are the balances of power established? You can consider um, whether it was established artificially, such as through peace treaties, or naturally. Third question is, is the balance of power an effective me method of maintaining peace? What are the limits to the balance of power? The fourth question, what are some factors that could damage a balance of power or render it in ineffective? Um, some examples you could look into are international internal policy of nat nations, relations between multiple nations, factors completely outside of the regional power balance of powers, such as the Russo-Japan War. Uh, the fifth question is, is the balance of power always just between two large sides through individual nations may align themselves with one or the other? Could there be more factions that could choose to stay neutral in the event of a conflict between two sides? Okay, now we'll be moving into some of the key period time periods that we will be focusing on today. So we'll go as early as the Congress of Vienna, uh, the concert of Europe and pre-World War I alliances. Um, also, um, some general knowledge on European conflicts between 1815 to, to 1914, such as the Crimean War, the Austro-Prussian War, the Franco-Prussian War, and the dynamics between Austria, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire in the Baltics during that period is also important. All right, okay. So, um, let's, let's start with the first question. Um, what is the balance of power? <laughs> like... Does anyone have a definition for that? There's no monopoly on power, essentially. Right, yeah. So, in order um, to yeah, in order to preserve peace, um, Siva said that. Um, yep, yeah, so I would agree with that. Um, I'd say the balance of power is basically, if you think of an equilibrium system, so um, states work to preserve the balance of power, ensuring that not one state would become too powerful. Um, that it would just overpower any other state that's in the system. Um, so, yeah, so that's basically the balance of power. Basically, in order to maintain peace, um, there are system countries that are equally there um, to maintain, like, what I, what I use, what I like to use the analogy of the checks and balances um, of the, like, if, of the US Constitution um, to ensure that um, not one state, not one sector becomes too too powerful that they become um, unmanageable to um, compete with. Okay, so um, basically, uh, my my question right now is um, how 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 does the balance of power become maintained? Um, and if if a country like say say state A becomes too powerful, um, what are some ways that um, the other states can do to maintain the balance of power? Uh, generally, the way is forming an alliance or a coalition of states to uh, even out the power distribution so they can, uh, in order for mutual protection, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you go into more detail of like, like, uh, like the point of um, alliance and how it works? So generally alliances are formed either to um, well, a lot of the time, it's, it's a one nation will ask another nation like for an alliance in exchange for if they are attacked, then the other nation will come to their aid, and yeah. and if but at the cost of if their ally is attacked, then they must come to their aid, and it's a generally mutual um, mutual protection. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I would use the word like mutual security or yes, yeah. like protection um, from like a larger, more stronger and more dominant force um yeah but you could also call your allies to 
war as well. And then like try to attack someone with your ally, right? And that's also a thing. Not just defensive. But arguably that's mutual security so that you don't lose that war when you attack. It's sort of like a deterring factor, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um so yeah, I, I agree with Kenny. Um so basically basically yeah. um if, if two states let ally each other, um, basically the one state, if they were to attack one of the states, um, the strongest state would have to like face them both, um, and that would be strategically and militarily unfair and unfavorable. So it serves as a deterrent, and um, I guess that would be one method of maintaining peace is like always like preserving this sort of like equilibrium, so no nation is able to like just overpower everyone else. Um, so like they, it, the system is maintained. Wouldn't would you guys agree with that? Mm, look at North Korea, for instance. Their haste in producing nuclear weapons and developing nuclear capabilities was primarily for the purpose of deterring other nations. Yep. Yeah, uh, yep. Yeah, okay. Where are you going? Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah I, I, I mean, that's that's similar, but arguably unrelated. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, I thought we were just talking about deterring factors here. Yeah, we're no, actually no not allowed to talk about anything that happens after 1920. Ah, oh, okay, understandable. And we're talking about it's a strictly alliances, enforced not... rule. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, no, but yeah, uh, we respect that. Um, deterring factors. Yep. Yeah. Um, a country would do whatever it takes to maintain a sense of security over its own nation um, from being attacked from other nations. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, the other, the other um, fact, uh, scenario where I think um, a balance of power is maintained is so if if one country has su- is suddenly growing in power, um, it could be like for various reasons, like a, a radical political change or like um, like industri- like rapid industrialization, that the state becomes very very powerful economically, politically, uh, and materially. Um, another way that it can maintain the balance of power is if another country ri- ri- rivals this growth and power of of this state. Um, and um, I think that was probably like what happened during World War One, um, uh, like the lead up to World War One. Um, this is my opinion: is that you have Germany, who's like a rising power, and Britain had to match that power, and it was like the competition between the two states. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that more later in a different question, but what are your thoughts on that uh, for now? Uh, I mean, I, I think that's, yeah, that's definitely a part of it. It's, it's obviously not the, the whole thing. It's not the whole story, but yeah, yeah. It, it is a significant part. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I would agree. You would agree? Okay. Um, yeah, so <laughs> let, let me just like give you like a breakdown of like, because I know that most of you guys haven't done any like European history, so um, I just did some research on like the important treaties that were signed uh, in the 19th century. Um, so everyone will probably know um, the Treaty of London uh, in 1839. Um, that was like um, the United Kingdom and Germany would sign. Well, it was Prussia back then would um, sign to protect the Bel- Belgium's neutrality and. Uh, this treaty was very significant because it would like, it would be the reason why uh, Brit- the British would join the war, um, World War One. In 1879, there was a du- dual alliance between Germany and Austria-Hungary. Um, this was um, for the sake of protecting each other uh, in the event of a Russian invasion or a Russian attack. So that was that was like one of the first lead up to the Triple Alliance. Um, in 1892, the Franco-Russian military convention that promised mutual assistance in the face of attack. Uh, note, note the word mu- mutual assistance. It wasn't really an alliance. It was just um, like, as uh, we've said before, like this mutual collective security. Um, they weren't really allies in a sense. They were just... Were, were they like dis- defensive packs? Yeah, they yeah, I think so, because of the growing power and the central power. And then, like, they would form the Triple triple Entente in the uh, United Kingdom. And the Triple Alliance uh, 
would, would be formed between Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. Italy, uh, they decided not to join the war, uh, World War One. Um, it would later become the Ottoman Empire. Um, but Italy formed a uh, unification, uh, like alliance with Germany. Um, but um, they didn't. They decided to stay neutral in World War One, although that's not entirely true. But why are we talking about World War One? Shouldn't we talk about the balance of power in the nineteenth century? Um, but it's leading yeah. up to World War One. Yeah, uh, so so you guys, just the breakdown of all the alliance systems, you have the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance, right? Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on to our second question, which is, um, how is the balance of power established? Um, like, uh, is it established through peace conferences or can it be naturally, will it be naturally established um, through time? Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on that? Um, I, I think it really depends on the uh, situation to an extent. So, so some of it is, uh, yeah, more natural, and a lot of it from like pre-existing um, cultural alliances or cultural similarities. Okay. Um, yeah. And a lot, but a lot of the time, it's uh, just some of the time it's desperation, and other times it's um, like. You know, just oh, interest. mutual interest in such an alliance. Yeah, and I also want to add that it can also be preemptive, like um, like you form an alliance first um, to basically protect yourself from like future attacks or something from a growing. Uh, I like to point out that uh, a balance of power doesn't necessarily have to be alliances. Like it could just only be like a number of powers like deciding that they won't let one of them grows stronger and like if anyone grows too strong they will band together to stop it yeah. to maintain like a status quo in the region yeah that's true, yeah. Yeah, that's true. like uh the best example of this would be like the congress of vienna after napoleon wars mm -hmm. uh we are like there were like a number of border changes across the, across europe between like mainly by the directed by the major powers of the time france great britain Prussia, Austria, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire. Like they basically tried to maintain, uh, they basically managed to maintain like a status quo of like pa balancing powers in Europe for almost as, for like about an entire century. Like most of the wars fought during the later 19th century were minor or like. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, so so it's good that you mentioned the Treaty of Treaty and the Congress of Vienna. Um, I was gonna move on to that pretty soon. Um, so, so now that now that you've mentioned it, uh, let's talk about the Treaty of the Congress of Vienna. Um, so, so um, have you guys heard of like the Congress system of Europe, like the Congress of Europe, uh, as they like to call it? Um, concept. Sorry, the concept. concept yes, of the concept yes. of Europe. <laughs> um, it's it's basically just um, what you expect in the like American Congress, which is like. You've got like different states that are part of like this system um and they need to ensure that like everything like like ensure that peace is maintained basically um ken would you like to add up add, add to that like so like it doesn't have to be like two big alliance systems like rivaling each other for balance it could just be like a number of like great powers with like smaller powers in line with them and like trying to balance each other's out each other out so no one grows too powerful yeah yeah um yeah that that is like yeah that, that is the fundamental principle of balance of power um and we can use we can use the uh what happened in after the congress of vienna to sort of like show show this was the case um so so the congress of vienna was like the after the treaty of vienna was the aftermath um of the defeat of napoleon uh from uh, the Battle of Waterloo. Um, so, so basically, um, I think you guys heard like Napoleon and Bonaparte was like wreaking havoc um, on Europe um, and then he was defeated. And so I, I would say that, I would say that France was like a really powerful state um, yeah. during that time. Oh yeah, they, uh, they yeah, honestly could have easily invaded a lot of, most of Europe and gotten away with yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, if they hadn't invaded Russia, maybe they would have yeah, no, maintained, they... maintained 
this power for longer, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, um, so after Why, Frank... Kurt, you don't oh, yeah. Russia. Sorry, what was that, Silver? That's why Kurt, you don't invade Russia. Exactly, yeah. Just, um, Hitler didn't pick that advice. Just... <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so what I was saying was um, to ensure that France wouldn't would wouldn't be like this like strong as our states um they needed to make sure france was weakened but also not weakened to such an extent that it would not it would cease to become like a power or a rival rival power um which is not the reason not a favor they tried to return to germany that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> uh well yeah they tried to make sure germany would collapse but um that didn't really work did it <laughs> no um, so I think, um, like after after the, uh, the Congress of Vienna, uh, Russia, the Empire of Russia became like quite a really a really strong state, um, and so uh, this is why like uh, all the European countries wanted to try and restore the monarch in France, uh, because the, a monarch in France, a monarchy would would what would in some ways like be a check for the uh, Russian Empire, which was like grow growing pretty rapidly. Um, and so like this was like one of the measures they took was to ensure that France would be would not re remain as this menace uh, country in Europe, but not to such an extent um, that other other nations would try and like uh, become like overpowerful, like overpowered and stuff like that. Um, and also, like, uh, it also made sure, made sure that no no other nation would be like left unhappy after the con after the treaty, because then they would like have like aggressive foreign policies. Right. Yeah. It's, it's something they um, realized oh, back right. then, then completely forgot a hundred years later. You know. Yeah, I would agree. It was actually it, no, it was more effective. Um, no, it wasn't. Well, no, no, yeah, but it, I mean, it lasted. A bit longer. Okay. It wasn't as strict, but it, it did last a lot longer than the, uh, you know, like the breaking up of uh, the attempted breakup of, of Germany and the establishment of the Weimar Republic. Oh yeah, yeah, that that was that was a. It wasn't horrible. successful. It was more successful, <laughs> which is not saying much. No, I I would say that uh, France did maintain its power uh, and status quo after the Treaty of Vienna. Um, yeah. Yeah. Much better, much better than uh, what they tried to do with Germany after World War One. Yeah. 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 So, 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 yeah. The Treaty of Vienna mm. is a very good, is a very good example um, for like countries um, trying to maintain like this balance of power, like try, ensuring that France is like destabilizing country um, as it always always was um, of Europe, because if France falls, then uh, I think the balance of power completely. Uh, just seek to exist when you agree. So like uh, uh, a country that played like a really big part in like how about how the balance of power was established at the tri uh, Congress of Vienna was Britain. Yeah. Because like unlike all the other European super uh, great powers, Britain understood that it can never achieve dominance over mainland Europe. So and so its entire policy was centered around that no one will ever get to invade Britain in the future. Yeah. Which is why, like, they want to like an independent Belgium. Uh, why they want to like all the all the like the, the powers in mainland Europe to be balanced against each other, so no one will grow strong enough to invade the British Isles. Yeah, um, I would I would agree with that. Um, um, that's that's a good way of summing up Britain. Um, Britain was in a like favorable position, geopolitical position in terms of like it was uh, it was like in isolation but in a good way. Because it wouldn't be uh, invaded through by land. It had to be invaded from the sea. Yeah, it wasn't really isolated from mainland Europe, but it was um, its attempts to stop anyone like, close to them becoming powerful enough to cross the um, British Channel were successful. Um, yep. Yeah, so, so, so you could, you guys could see like how different countries have like um, different motivating uh, motiv motivating factors. Um, for them to like participate in the uh, uh, balance of power, um, for Britain it was to main ensure that no no country would be powerful enough to like control all of Europe. Basically, no empire would be strong enough to do so. 
Another factor that I, I'd like to bring up um, was is um, the scramble for Africa. Um, so scramble for Africa began in the 1800s. Um, it was like uh, you had like a bunch of colonial um, empires such as Portugal, France, Britain, uh, Spain at that time, who were like competing for uh, territory in Africa. Um, and uh, like there are like many benefits for like um, having an, an overseas empire. Um, it, I mean, like obviously the one is for the sake of military power, resources, um, for the sake of ego in a sense and like identity. Um, but in order to make sure that um, they would like peacefully rival each other is, which is a good term that I'd use for balanced power, peaceful ri rivals. Um, was the Berlin Conference. Um, so does anyone know about the Berlin Conference? Uh, I get. I take that as a no. That was a no. <laughs> That's a yeah, no. not really. That's all right. Um, but I mean, I, I just like learned that like just, just one hour ago. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ber the Berlin uh, Conference was basically, uh, you had like 14 different European nations uh, came together to sort out like the territories of um, Africa, like who would control which territories. Um, note the word territories because um, there weren't like actual boundaries back then. Um, Africa was like ruled, like split in terms of territories. Well, uh, in, in the eyes of the Europeans. Yeah, yeah, in the eyes of the Europeans. Definitely. Um, people in Africa didn't totally agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so basically, the Europeans basically just drew drew a bunch of lines um, on the map and say, okay, you control France, you control West West Africa, uh, person, you get South Africa, uh, Portugal, you get like um, some parts of the some parts of Eastern Africa and like all that stuff. Um, basically, um, they would take the most important um, regions in Africa, the ones with like the most rich in resources and stuff. So, so, so that was a way of like maintaining like this peaceful rival rivalry between all the different col colony uh, empires right um yeah does anyone have like anything to add to that uh i mean th those uh yeah with, with south africa i'm not sure um the dutch were very happy with the, or the dutch people living in south africa were happy, very happy to have the British there oh yeah um yeah does anyone know about the boer war um yes yeah a um, little bit yeah um, I think the Boer War is too relevant regarding this, so... Yeah, the, the Boer War doesn't really... It, it's like, it's, it's a bit of a, like, conflict between... And, like, it's like yeah. a civil conflict for Britain. It's not really, like, a European... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not a balance of power. Mm-hmm, yeah. I would agree. Uh, the Boer, the Dutch weren't really a powerful nation in the late 19th century. So I, I would like to talk about the Crimean War. Um, does anyone know like what happened, like they, like briefly what happened in the Crimean War? Um, basically Russia got trashed. And... <laughs> Russia got trashed. <laughs> and they yeah, and they found out their uh, army wasn't great, and they needed to Yeah, uh, I, I, I had a brief read on read on that. Um, so I think the British and the French were concerned about the growing power of and the industrialization of um, Russia, um, which is why uh, they, which is why they challenged Russia in the Crimean War, um, and it didn't go great for the Russians um, due to their lack of industrialization and the like unstable uh, government and stuff. Um, yeah, so Crimean War. Um, it basically basically russia had russia was no longer like considered like a major power um it had to go re like it had to go for industrialize again um for a little bit like i think they did go through industrial periods for 50 years and, and then they just stopped again um because um because of the in inefficiency of the uh of the sars i guess yeah take take into history uh you'll you'll learn all about the, the bourgeoisie didn't have a chance Inefficient. Yeah, screw That's, the... why That's why communism failed, guys. <laughs> Wait, Whoa, that? you're speaking that? that in front of me? You know, that's a bit too far. Yeah, what was that, Silver? <laughs> yeah, you dare to say that again? <laughs> 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 I 
All right. Um. Okay. Yep. So, so we've covered we've covered a little bit about um basically how how the balance of power is is maintained and how how it is established um through alliance um through um like uh, powers state not wanting another state to be grow too powerful enough um and to maintain like this equilibrium state. Um. So now let's let's like talk about another question like what are the limits of the balance of power like do you think there are any flaws to the balance of power or do you think it's like a perfect system like um there was nothing wrong with the balance of power i think personally that uh, the balance of power is not always um it's it's not always balanced uh, that's things you're, you're never going to have a perfect <laughs> balance so mm. it's a happening is a bunch of powerful nations end up going hey we're all powerful we can take these annoying guys out if we really want to you know and that's yeah. I guess what happened to Africa <sighs> was that it, it was not a balance of power at all, and the you know the less able or less aware nations in Africa just got wiped out because they had no chance. Now, on the other hand, the balance of power also breaks, you know, and, that, and that's what happened leading up to World War One. It was somewhat balanced, but it collapsed anyway. Despite the balance. Of power. I think why like the balance of power collapsed by World War One was because like balance of power is based on like a system of like fluid like nations are like nations don't have like strict alliances binding them to each other <laughs> thanks kitty they were like fluid enough like they're a they're allowed to like go ally with whoever they want to counter the largest threat however by the time of the first world war all the major powers were allied with each other so like they're really like eventually if they come into conflict they will have like a major war Arguably, that means the balance of power collapsed when the Entente and the Triple Alliance were formed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would, I would agree. Um, I'd say like balance of power. Um, you only have an alliance uh, when you have like a really strong nation. Um, really strong nation. Um, and there's a need for an alliance between like the uh, weaker, like cons relatively weaker states. Uh, however, um, if all the like strongest nations like al ally themselves together, then it's just an alliance system. It's not really a balance of power anymore. Yeah, because like you need to make sure you can like always speed up the aggressor really quickly. But like if you have like two only two major alliance systems, you can't really beat them up and deter them as well as you can where like you can just gang up on them with like five of your buddies. Yeah, um, I would well, agree. Not necessarily, but I think the reason why it collapsed was. Uh, like the amount of power needed by one side to foul the other side was so great and uh, like there was a massive race in arms right and we had other factors such as like nationalism and other stuff right in those countries which made it so that like balance of power was not really the only factor that influenced whether war would take place or not Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, balance of power is by far not the only factor in the balance yeah, yeah, of yeah. one. It's just the one we're discussing. Yeah, yeah that, um, that's not the only reason why it collapsed. I think I think there are like many reasons to why um, the balance of power collapsed. Um, one of them definitely you mentioned was uh, nationalism. Um, nationalism was like a very big factor uh, in the in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century. Um, um, which you guys should know about the Balkan crisis. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, like, like, yeah, nationalism was definitely um, a big factor. Um, also, like, um, you have like uh, historical, like, like countries may also have like his historical ri rivalry. Like, um, Britain and France um, used to have like uh, we're, we're like rivals for like a hundred, like, like the like for so long, right? But however, um, they still ended up um, allying themselves during World War One. So, so, um, so, so the question I'd like to pose is, um, like, do states only engage in the balance of power for the sake of like self-interest and like only for their own interest rather than like for the system to actually work? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's kind of almost a fundamental part of a um, probably balance of power yeah. is the fact yeah. that. You know, if everyone's, yeah, it's all in their own interest. None of them really cared because, I mean, you know, militarism was still a huge thing. Even It didn't build just build up to World War One. It was all throughout Europe for hundreds of years. 
I don't think any like nation intends for there to be a balance of power. Like if they could emerge as the dominating presence, they would naturally do that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, if they do become more powerful, other countries navigate in a way to counteract their increase in power. Yeah. So like mainly forming alliances, for instance, right? If, uh, what is it? My history is a bit rusty, but yeah, okay. <laughs> if, if some really powerful nation got even more powerful, right? All the other poles of powers would ally. Yeah, yeah. and obviously, um, obviously uh, the powerful nation wouldn't want itself to be ganged up upon by every other nation. Um, so it would try and seek alliances themselves, itself, right? To try mm. and protect itself from like the potential of everyone else rivaling against them. Like, like what happened to France um, during the Battle of Waterloo. Um, um, and and yeah, that was like that 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 was like one of the factors that basically created the uh, alliance system was. Um, but um, when you talk about how um, like nation will instinctively want to like try and try and emerge as the most powerful um, of all all of the all the other collective, um, wouldn't you say Britain never really had that view? Um, like. Britain knew that um, it couldn't maintain an empire in in uh, mainland Europe, um, but it just wanted to maintain like this uh, isolation um, and also like protect itself from invasions, right? Well, not really. Right? They were invading other countries, so yeah, but well, not in Europe. I, I think yeah, it's... but was that just because of Queen Victoria and what she wanted to do? Like after her death, it did change a bit, and before she became queen, there was a slightly different approach. What was Queen Victoria's approach? Do you know? She was, I think it was just like a lot of royal marriages and very little war in Europe. Yeah. So like she fought one war in Europe and then the era before that they fought like five or something. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. she just didn't really want to fight. Thanks to the, the balance of power. Yeah, wars were actually fought in Europe. They weren't fought. There was, you just married, um, uh, you basically tried to get your royal family to marry oh, yeah. other people's royal yeah. family. Yeah. And yeah. On the note of uh, Britain and Europe, I think it, it was probably a mix of things. First of all, because they, you know, fighting a war in Europe, Europe was actually not quite easy for them. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, also, and especially because how much uh, money the Napoleonic Wars had cost them. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think not having Euros in, uh, wars in Europe, despite the fact that Britain's off the side, meant that. You know the balance of power couldn't be overrun by one specific power and that was also kind of in their interest but it is probably true to an extent that they didn't want that there might have been a moral conscience of not wanting wars to an extent um yeah yeah, yeah. um uh, could you also think that maybe britain knew itself like it couldn't it couldn't like become emerge as the dominant power of europe so that's why it, it, it chose to engage in the balance of power yeah, yeah. I, arguably that's also true because they didn't really have that much of a foothold on any anywhere in mainland Europe, so they couldn't really, as, even though they could defend themselves, they couldn't really attack either. Yeah, yeah, yeah because like all Britain can really attack is like France, and like there's no way Britain's gonna beat France. Um, history would, be, yeah. Wait, like... what era are we talking about here? Nineteenth uh, century. Because. <laughs> Britain was still a really powerful contender. Like, oh, it was. Before the but World like, Wars. It was, definitely, yeah. Yeah. It just couldn't, yeah, like, I... hope to, like, manage a massive colonial empire as well as, like, an empire on mainland Europe. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I... they spread their reach too thin and far. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and, like, Britain doesn't want to. It was, like, rich enough. Like, why does it need to, like, go down and, like, join in the lowly squabbles of mainland <laughs> peasants? <laughs> yeah, the times were changing. The times were changing by then. <clears throat> Wait, Armin, Armin, would you agree that Britain was plateauing during the like early nineteenth, early twentieth century? Um, the thing is, I mean, I, I, first of all, I think you have to admit that there was a sort of plateau going on. It was, but everything has to fall, right? You, you, Britain got yeah. up to being the most, the most powerful colonial force, probably in the history of of the world actually or it was up there so obviously you're gonna have to you can't maintain that peak forever exactly yeah so it was beginning its journey down but at the same time i mean one thought that i've always had is that was it partly because the times were changing as well you had a more you know people were beginning that 
I'm not sure exactly what, but obviously there was the fact that they was they were affected by the wars and the, the effort of having to sustain such a drawn out conflict. Yep. But also times were changing. It wasn't the time for having a massive colonial empire anymore. You know, globalization and all that. I don't know. Uh, but global, yeah, globalization might be a bit too early, but um, there was you know what I mean. It, it was on the horizon. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, national sovereignty uh, was beginning to. Mm, develop. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, national sovereignty. Um, it was a problem for Britain. It was a definitely a problem for the Austro-Hungary Empire, um, and the Ottoman Empire. Um, but basically, um, states states wanted to uh, maintain their independence from Britain, um, like uh, during the early twentieth century, um, which is why I, I would say that Britain was in decline. Um, Arguably, Britain wasn't like it, it was in decline to an extent, but Britain was still at its uh, the British Empire was still like at its largest until like nearly 1900. Yes, yes, that that's true. But it was on its fall was on the horizon because, as I said, you can't stay right at the top yeah, yeah, forever. Yeah, yes, yes. yes. And the, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the problem the problem Britain uh, was facing was that um, Germany was like a rising power um, during the late 19th, early 20th century period um so um we you we, you have the franco-prussian war um which basically uh, <clears throat> uh which basically uh meant that the french got pummeled by the prussians but it also led to the uh unification of germany meaning that um, the balance of power would be shifted in favor of germany instead of france um so no longer were like uh britain and france considered like the top of the balance of power it was now germany that was going to rival um, Britain, yeah. and um, so so uh, I th I think like Britain saw it necessary, so it was necessary to ally itself with um, France. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean it, it would have been quite frightening seeing all these kind of disassociated states in Germany suddenly unite under um, the leadership of Otto um, van Bismarck. I think yeah. Bob Bismarck, thank you very much. Um, and just seeing all that um, come together as well, seeing France just get cleaned um, <laughs> so easily, it would have been pretty frightening for the other European powers. Yeah, so I... they'd either draw to uh, ally, them <clears throat> ally themselves with this new great power or to want to defend themselves from it. Uh, also, like, uh, losing like the Franco-Prussian War meant like France got its... Uh, the Second French Empire got dissolved, so France was a republic, which were like, oh yeah, yeah, contribute to why like Britain liked it a bit more compared to say a Bonaparte on the throne. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Um, yeah, so so France was definitely like a declining power um, late nineteenth century, um, mm -hmm. and since it was a declining power, um, France would be more inclined to ally itself with a uh, still a, a strong nation and state in Britain um, because they saw they, they saw uh, that Germany was um, growing in power rapidly yeah and, yeah, and, and, um, and also at the time you know, this, this new united group of states in the middle like of Europe oh yeah, yeah, yeah. massive you know huge, yeah, huge was, part of Europe it, it, it did send, send, like, send like lots of uh, fear and terror uh, into like all the other nations when like the central powers um, formed the uh, triple alliance. Um, you had Italy, Germany, and Austria Hungary. Like that's just pretty much almost like the entire of Europe, I would say. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a massive portion of it. And suddenly, like, you know, you have Russia who wants to expand their empire suddenly come up against this wall of, um, of, uh, of Prussia. Uh, you have, and Britain and France, who thought they were, you know, they were the, some of the most powerful countries in Europe, suddenly facing this massive uh, land military that they can't necessarily defeat. They don't know that they can defeat. Yeah, yeah. So, so now that we've um, gone to the topic of uh, Germany and uh, Brit like Britain as the two, like, I'd say, relatively strong powers emerging in the early 20th century. Um, I'd like to lead to the final question of today, which is, is the balance of power always just between two large sides? Um, like, like, nation, like weaker nations would choose to align themselves with other, uh, well, align themselves with like these stronger nations, um, that, like they would pick a side and like, yeah, uh, what do you guys think? I mean, here, Not necessarily. Well, here, here we can see um, that 
like the ba balance of power suddenly being um, just uh, thrown in the air by the uniting the Germany, and everyone was ch uh, forced to pick a side because the balance of power was broken, rather than because there was a power a balance of power. Right, right, right. That that's a very interesting approach to it. Uh, yeah. Um, Siva, did you have anything to say, add to that? I just wanted to say that, like, you don't necessarily need to have like two parties. You could have three or four, but uh, the thing is, like, you don't want uh, your party to be so weak that it doesn't like it doesn't matter if you have a party or not. Like, you can have four parties, but you don't want like you know two of them to be so weak that. You can't really do anything. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I would, yeah, I would agree. Um, but also you had like, um, so you had like the national move, nationalism movements uh, in like uh, the Baltic states. Um, Ser Serbia themselves, they wanted to protect their independence uh, from the Austria Austro-Hungary Empire, and nationalism was a big part of uh, what pretty much started the World War One. Um, like, like, um, you could say it was one of the main factors. Uh, yeah, I, I would say so. Um, <laughs> Do you remember uh, fourth from history? Milita uh, militarism. Um, oh, yeah. 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 Militarism, nationalism. Uh, imperialism. Whatever. Yeah, uh, so yeah, imperialism. Nationalism, yeah. No, alliances, yeah. Yeah, yeah, alliances. Alarmism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism. The good old fourth Oh, yeah, yeah, happy days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we, we pretty much covered, like, um, alliance and nationalism and some some bits of imperialism um, but national nationalism um, I think was the sparking point of like actually like making it making like the world, world war one topple over and happen yeah like um, like um, what, I, what I was trying to say was um, like Serbia like I didn't I don't think Serbia necessarily wanted to like be part of like the um, mixed into like the alliance system and stuff they, they just wanted to maintain their independence but since they weren't like a strong enough nation they had to like request help from the russian empire yeah and the russians were like you know, uh, yeah, uh, pan -slav -slav -slav. like having austria there so they're pretty happy to help exactly yeah um so, so would you say that countries who are trying to maintain neutrality um, would find it hard because, um, like, like if they weren't if they weren't part of like an, a big alliance system, they would be affected in some ways. What about yeah. Switzerland? Oh yeah, Switzerland is a very special case. Switzerland, <laughs> yeah, Switzerland's odd. You know, just... when I wrote, you know, when I wrote the first question, I, wait, so you know, when I wrote the first question, I had no idea what I was writing because it was like twelve o'clock and I just showered. And like I didn't want to have four questions, so I was trying to write one more. <laughs> but like I'm really proud of you guys to like get so much stuff out of it. Yeah, that's very we appreciate, we appreciate yeah. your questions. Yeah, Ken. Good, good questions. They're, good they're questions. really good questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ken, yeah, Ken. When you were writing them, like, what were you thinking? Uh, with the <laughs> final question. <laughs> what were you? From what you said, I don't know if he was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I was like, every time Roger writes, like. A topic right he has like seven key questions but then i'm yeah. just looking at my four and like oh that's not enough so i'm like <laughs> i might as well write one more but i was like so sleepy by then like it just i was like just desperate to finish the facebook post so uh, it's still yeah. taking us a full hour yeah it's like, it takes quite a while to write down key questions that's why we should appreciate teachers right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah um but i mean I think I think like throughout history, it's always been like a conflict between two dominant powers, right? Don't you think? Yeah. Um, so so like even even in the late twentieth century, you had like conflict between the USSR and the USA. Um, I'd say I like personally, I'd argue that uh, in World War One, it was between uh, Germany and uh, Germany and Britain. Um, like um, I'm, I'm open for. Like, oh no, I, I agree with you there. With the, the I think we, yeah. Uh, I think I'm not sure that's entirely true. It's sort of like what we've got today, where the two dominant powers you could argue are what America and traditionally Russia in the latter half of the 20th century, right? Yeah. And now we're moving into a sort of era where you're going to have China coming up. Yeah. And then you're going to have places like India, and then 
maybe India, and then after that, maybe even places like Brazil. So it, it, it's, I, I think it, it's not really fair to consider Germany. Not Brazil. The, Who cares about Brazil? Germany and Britain as the two main powers because, but while both of them were competing, I, I think it's it's easy to underestimate how much of a threat uh, Russia was perceived as. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll genuinely like argue that it's always just between two rival powers. Um, I was going to bring up like um, the naval race b between uh, Germany and G Germany and Britain. Like only, uh, the, yeah. only yeah, those, that, only cool. those two, only those two nations were capable of produce like competing with each other because of their e economy and resources. Like no other country was able to compete in the dreadnought naval race, right? Um. So, so like the naval race pretty much cement for me it's cement Germany and Britain as the two main major powers uh, during World War One. Hmm. Never thought of it that way. <laughs> no, he's right. He's got a point. I mean, I think the thing is that uh, usually countries try to join in when existing rivalries. So yeah. That's the thing uh, when you have like two sides, right? Even though like countries. You know, like you could have three countries, but usually one would join the other in like rivaling the main two. I mean, yeah? the the other thing though is that Britain was not near, it wasn't like that strongly allied with France. I really it joined World War no, One because of Belgium, because of the treaty. No, they didn't. No, they, no, they didn't. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, they 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 were like on France's side. In France, they were on the same side, but. I mean, they declared war on Germany because of Belgium, at least not. I'll, I'll, I would agree. I would argue that if Treaty of Brit Treaty of London didn't exist, Britain would still find a way to try and join the war, because um, uh, Germany was going to uh, run a steamroll over France, and then they would probably defeat Russia as well. So if, if they if that happens, then Germany will probably control entire the entirety of Europe. Yeah, mm. that's probably true. They should have pulled in America and just like stayed out of the war while supplying arms to profit. Yeah, but that wouldn't work. Because that, that that yeah, happened um, that, later on. Though you can't just keep you can't just keep fighting a proxy war. Yeah, like for example, was far too close to the action to really do. That. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, another thing is right. Germany would have steamrolled France by the time like you know. Schlieffen plan. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, that was good. That was good. Why didn't the Schlieffen? Oh, Belgium, yeah. Yeah, because Belgium was like, you know, no, you're not actually walking over me. You shall not pass. You shall not yeah. Like, yeah, where, 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 are, where, are, IG, where are IGCSC history scholars right now? Hey, IG history scholar. <laughs> oh, hell yes. Yeah, Belgium were like, I have a stick and I hit you on the knee. And I'm like, ow. <laughs> ow. That sums it up. <laughs> I'd I'd say that uh, the U.S. even like this was probably more to do with World War Two was like they tried U.S. also tried to fight a proxy war in World War Two. They did that in World War One, surely for a bit, right? Yeah, for a bit. Yeah, they, did. they did. They basically did the same thing in World War One and World War Two. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, maybe maybe that's the way to win win a war is basically join later when everyone's all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Don't get clean up. Just just yeah. Basically, just come in and just mop up the rest, you know. Yeah. Um. But in the end, it's always like it always seems to me like um, like one one power is gonna be ganged up by like all the other powers. Like it happened to Germany like twice, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Germany. Yeah, they were antagonizing everyone, so it was like uh, sort of been. They weren't anti. Uh, yeah. They no, okay. No, they are, talking, one, are we talking World War One yeah, or World War Two? Yeah. II? Okay. This does defend. No, the thing is, that's, that, yeah. that's actually a good, interesting point, though, because there, there was an extent where nations were, you know, even maybe without realizing it, like, directly um, overriding the concert of Europe and the things put into, you know, keep peace for their own benefit. And, I mean, and a lot of, there's also a lot of, you know, paranoia as well, you know, leading up to it from both sides. And yeah, that's why um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of the militarism caused more militarism, and it just kind of cycled. And into a... I mean, yeah, that's it's that's the thing of like militarization is that if one one country militarization, then all the other countries would start militarizing. Which... Mm. Yep, in order to keep up. 
So, so um, would, would you say that balance of power was the most efficient way um, of, um, of uh, maintaining peace? Because all you're having is when one, one, one state militarizes, all the others would follow suit. Uh, yeah, that's actually yeah, that's a good yeah. point, actually, yeah. Because the balance of power, it's not something, we we're talking about it like it's something that you like, you know, have to dig up and establish, but it sort of establishes itself, doesn't it? Yes. As you yeah. said, if one person starts militarizing, then everyone else starts as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's almost, yeah, it's almost they don't want to be overrun. Hmm. Going back to the first question, it's, it's almost like a... System of equilibrium. Yeah. <laughs> kind of chemistry, yeah. <laughs> And the problem is, like, before that, I mean, you would have had tons of balances of power kind of organized. Little balances everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, so how, how I would summarize, summarize this whole thing of balance of powers, I mean, conflict is going to be inevitable, uh, like, in, in like sooner, sooner or later. Mm -hmm. um, I think, like, I think, like, the balance of power was just the concept thrown uh, by, by many historians and also, like, contemporary his, contemporary politicians during the time in order to like make it seem as though the country like the nation the continent was peaceful but in actual fact it really wasn't uh, um I, I think there was an extent to which it was more significant but yeah yeah that's probably true to an extent like if you just completely take away the concept of balance of power um what would happen <laughs> i think there was a small like it, it was more balanced than it had been in the past yeah but, yeah uh, but you also have a good point the thing with balance of power is it doesn't really maintain peace it just stops one power from becoming too strong so it's not but because like for example with like the crimean war and the napoleonic wars it doesn't really maintain peace no it doesn't yeah yeah, yeah. that's a good point. balance of power really only maintains peace when you've got a sort of when you move up to the level of mutually assured destruction, yeah, right? I'd say it works better with nuclear bombs. <laughs> 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 One of the only things <laughs> that, that, that might be the only way. Of... Yeah, I mean, like nu nuclear weapons, like, like, like the, it, it could cause the uh, mass extinction of the human race, but it's not like wars, right? It makes a good reading in history class, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. All right. Um, do you guys have anything else to add? Like. Any other points that you wanted to make? Um, I think that's everything. Really. I think. Uh, I was, I was bring, gonna bring up like the factor of geopolitical um, factors um, leading up to like um, alliances and stuff. How like um, you have like Germany who needed to ally themselves with like Italy and Austria Hungary because they were surrounded by the two major powers in Russia and France. That was like another country why alliance system happened in the first place. Yeah. yeah. So, so I guess that's the end of this session. Um, thanks for joining today.